Zealand's Motorcycle Heritage, brought to you by Classic Motorcycles. Nothing to the family weren't really into motorbikes. My dad rode one for about 100 metres in the army to get his licence, and that was it. But my grandfather had about nine bikes in the army, old army Indians and things, so he obviously had an interest. But when I was about 10 years old, uh, some friends of mine had these little YZ80 motocross bikes, so I'd ride them a little bit in the weekends. Really, when I was about 12, I saved up enough money to buy a motocross bike. But uh, mum and dad said the motorbikes are far too dangerous, you can't have one. So I was a bit upset about that, but I, when I was 15, I bought one anyway and left it at a friend's place. And by the time I was 18, I bought and sold about 20 bikes. Just wanting to get, you know, better ones, different ones. When I was 16, uh, 15, I had a Suzuki GT380 road bike. That was my first road bike. I, Bought for two hundred and fifty dollars and did it up and sold it for about seven fifty, which that was the only one I made money on. <laughs> and when I was eighteen, I started racing. Well, I I'd, I'd, be, I'd been to watch a race at Pukekohe. There's Robert Holden and Mike Webb and Bob Toomey and stuff on their two fifty production bikes. So I bought a two fifty production bike because I knew potentially you know you could race it. So. Um, it was a little KR 250 Kawasaki, and I would just ride it to work and back into to tech. I did a New Zealand Certificate of Engineering in Auckland, and uh, a friend of mine in class, he was riding to bikes in RZ350, and we we went to the go-kart track a couple of times, and just go round and round and round, and you know, get the feel of it, and went down to Hamilton to the road race meeting around the lake there, and um, I kind of thought, oh, a few guys at the back there, I could probably hang with them alright. And I entered a race at Pukekohe, a club round, a little club circuit. I just joined the club on the day and put two bits of tape down the fairing for number 11 and I took the mirrors off and off I went. And I was about third in my first race. Um, but pretty hooked on it from then on. Went on and did the whole winter series. And so, so the bike you rode to work was the bike you raced? Yeah. Then the following year, I got a TZR 250 and did the 250 production series. And then uh, the following year, I got a, another guy who worked at my father's work as a truck driver. He bought an FZR 1000, but Hungerford, and he used to ride it to work and let me race it in the weekends. We went halves in it, so I raced it in the weekends. So lucky I didn't fall off it. So, uh, and I used to do every race I possibly could. I got every club round I could, every meeting I could. I'd spend everything I had, you know, from my um, day at work, which, you know, I was only on about $7.50 an hour then, but it just all went into the racing. It was, uh, I'd, I'd find the money somehow to do it. And um, on the 250, I remember I'd enter 250 production, junior production, and Formula 2. So it's three races a class, so it's nine races. And then I'd enter senior production and Formula 1 on the, on the 1,000. And, yeah. It just came a time where I just clicked and I just got a lot, everything fell into place and I just started feeling much better on the bike and and I was, uh, and I was away. Neville Algy was, he went to do the six hour on his Yamaha 1000 and he asked me if I'd team up with him. He ended up um, losing the front as soon as he hit the brakes at the end of the straight at Manfield into the sweeper and he launched off the banking and the bike just clipped the top of the corrugated iron fence and it disappeared out into the scrub and Dennis was, I mean, not Neville was like a, you know, rag doll. He hit the fence and dropped on the ground and he chipped a bone in his neck, I think, so he had a neck brace on and he couldn't ride and he's the crew chief and I rode with another guy, um, Jeff McLaren and in the first hour, I uh, remember the steering key was real loose on the bike, it had undone itself so it was, it was clunking backwards and forwards about Oh, nearly two inches from pulling it out. <laughs> but it steepened up the steering on the brakes turning in. But I couldn't move off the seat going down the, all the way down the straight. It would get into a huge wobble if I just slightly moved my body. But um, I caught up to Aaron Slight, who's on the Yamaha 1000, and Bob Toomey's on the Suzuki 1100. 
I passed them both under breaks going into turn one. This is uh, towards the end of the first hour and um, got in front of them. And uh, Murray Carter from Yane Shanton closing back then. He was uh, in the stand, I think, and he, he called me up at work the next day and said, I believe you can go a long way in racing and you want to come and see me. And so I went to his 12th story uh, floor apartment in Remuera and he, um, he gave me a, a bit of money to go do the series and uh, he borrowed Lent us his Shanton track. And also Murray also organised for me to go and race the Suzuka 8 hour with Graham Crosby, which was an amazing eye opener for me because it was all, you know, the top GP riders were there and, you know, Rainey and Swans and Dern and Gardner and that was a big year, yeah, onto the international scene and then from doing that eight hour in Japan, um, Morinaga, who was running the Super Angel team, Yamaha team that McDermott rode for in 87, Aaron rode for in 88, he came out to New Zealand to see who he's going to get to ride for him for 89 when I was doing the, that Castrol, um, Castrol six hour. I was riding with Aaron Slight that year actually and he asked me to come and race for him in Japan <coughs> which was the first, I was getting paid for it too, which is, you know, the first, which is like a dream come true. I didn't think I'd make a career out of motorcycle racing, but I, I was always pretty hopeful. 91, I took my bike to Australia to try and impress at the Eastern Creek 500 GP that was there. So I went in the Superbike Support Race and I qualified pole position. And then I missed the start and caught up from 75th down up to just behind second place with two laps to go and Aaron Slight was leading it and the oil filter unscrewed and they went end for end and was famous on TV for a few years. Yeah, I just did a world superbike round at Manfield. Must have been 91, was it? Was it one in 91? And John came up to me afterwards the afternoon and said he liked the lines I was taking and things. And he told me about this bike he was building and he wanted to take it to Daytona. And, but I didn't really show much interest. I wanted to do 500 GPs or World Super Bikes and I didn't see how a homemade bike in New Zealand was really going to fit into that. And, but I, I, he asked Chris Haldane to ride it and Chris had agreed and I went to Rupino when Chris first rode it. I was with him. And the front end snapped off it. And Chris came down off a wheelie and he broke his collarbone and he didn't want to ride it, so John asked me if I would race it at Daytona and oh, I wasn't too sure about it really, but I went to, back to the workshop and I checked out it, you know, the part that broke and John made it in carbon fibre wishbone that sheared off. He made it in pretty solid cast aluminium, but, but there's still other lot of, lots of little bits on the bike which looked pretty fragile and I wasn't, because he wanted to make everything so light. And Daytona's, you know, 300 kilometres an hour around the banking and this. But, um, I said yes, I wanted to, uh, you know, make it overseas and I was at a bit of a loose end and I thought if I can impress some of the big American teams, you know, I'll, I'll go and do it. But it was an amazing thing to be part of, really. <coughs> Out of everything I've done in racing, uh, the Britain's the one that kind of stands the test of time and it's a legendary machine. Not only in New Zealand, it's getting more and more worldwide recognition all, all the time. So I didn't really get much practice because it cracked the cylinder liner pretty well straight away in practice. Mm. It overheat, I couldn't do more than two laps in a, in a row pretty much. So I qualified way back, I was 10 seconds off pole position, which was Pascal Picot on the fast by Ferrari Ducati, which was a full factory bike really that had you know, pretty well just won the World Superbike Championship the year before with a massive million dollars of budget. And we were from New Zealand and just no testing, just straight in the crate after it was built pretty much. And 15 laps at Ruapuna and I said to John I don't think we've got any chance of really staying at the front here and he's like yes, yes you can yeah, you can do it it's alright you, you'll, you'll be good you know you've come all this way and but he's really encouraging he knew how to get the best out of people and when the flag dropped I was I was just totally into it I was just fired up to the max and I was going to hang in there no matter what and, and um, ended up being 0.1 of a second off the outright lap record at Daytona which Doug Poland had from the year before and even he was totally excited. He was on pit wall, 
cheering, you know, going, well, what is this thing, you know? <laughs> and uh, I thought I had had Pascal covered, you know, because uh, Britain was a bit faster, especially in the slipstream at Daytona. But, um, yeah, the battery just, I think the wires were crossed to the battery or the rectifier had a problem or something, but it went flat and it started missing and cut out with a couple of laps to go. But still enough to make headlines around the world. Getting on the Britain, I couldn't ride that as hard as I wanted to. I kept asking John to put forks on it instead of the the, the, the skirt of front end that was on it, because um, I could only push that to a certain limit, then it just wouldn't want to go any harder. So um, I used to think that kind of taught me how to ride a bit slower, getting on the Britain. Cause, but um, you could make up for it in other areas if, if you had to, you know. You'd just ride around the issues, and could, because it was light and it had a lot of power, you'd just throw it in there anyway and um, get, you know, get through. And, it's still, still enough to, you know, set a lap record at Ruapuna, which lasted for 11 years. So, um, so but um, I, I've ridden so many different motorcycles in my time, you know, I, w well over 100, um, well over 100 circuits around the world. Sometimes I've thought whether, whether I might have ridden on more tracks than anyone else ever has, because I just, I did all the championships. That um, that were going on, you know, I did Asia and British Superbikes, World Superbikes, GPs, um, America. I did that, that series a few years and Macau, Isle of Man. And, um, I knew Mark quite well. We used to race together. Uh, we did Macau and we did a trip around Thailand and. Indonesia and stuff, and, and John had actually asked me to ask Mark to ride the bike at the Isle of Man. So I asked Mark, sitting outside a pool in a motel uh, in Indonesia, whether he'd be interested in riding the Britain. And he said, oh, maybe, you know, maybe. <laughs> and uh, he did end up, John got in hold of, hold of him and they worked out some kind of deal and did the North West and then the Isle of Man, and I just I spent a bit of time with him at the Isle of Man too. He had a great night. He was just cracking up, laughing at me on the dance floor at this place <laughs> one night, and, and then uh, on the track, you know, he he took left the the line, and I was behind him on the 600. Came around the corner, and there's a you know black line with a little hook on it, which is like a high side kind of mark, and uh, I thought, oh, that's a real bad place for something like that to happen, because it's, it's nearly 200 k's probably, and they run off and. And I came around the corner and just fits the Britain all over the track, and I thought, oh, this, this is serious. And uh, I pulled over, and there's a, a doctor on scene straight away. It was like a marshal on the. He said, oh, I don't think you should go back. It's fatal. And you know, I said, oh, he's a friend of mine. I just want to go and pay my respects anyway. And I went back, and he just said, oh, God bless you, Mark, kind of thing. And I had a pretty slow ride back to the to the pits, and and uh, John was seriously. You know, cut up about that. He was, he, he used to get really upset when riders were injured and he didn't even know them, you know, let alone someone on his own bike. And so it was a pretty tough time. And, you know, the Britain's gone on to inspire hundreds of thousands of people all around the world. And so it's something of, you know, of high value really. And sometimes things of, of great value can come at great cost as well. Uh, weird. One at Daytona again in '95, and then maybe Thruxton was it? And and then John couldn't come to one of the meetings in Europe because he just felt tired and didn't didn't know why. And um, I actually told Karen that my wife now on the phone. I said, "Oh, John just said he felt tired." And she took him around some flowers, and she arrived with flowers just when he got home from hospital with the news that he had two or three months to live. And he called me up on the phone and said, Andrew, thank, thank you for the flowers. You know, Karen said, these are from Andrew. And I just can't believe the timing. You know. um, I was thinking, what flowers? But he, he just, he knew I was a Christian. He said, you know, doctors can't do anything for me, but I believe in Jesus Christ. I love people, you know, can you pray for me or something? And I don't quite know what I helped much, but I put him back onto Karen. And he actually um, called Karen and said, could, could, could you... I know there's more to life. Could you come and read the Bible to me or something? And, and Karen <coughs> took an older lady from her church and um, went and saw, saw John. And, um, 
you know, if you would have wanted to do John, he said, I just want to totally give my life to God. I, you know, I know there's more. And they, you know, prayed for him. And uh, John called me up the next day, and he's just so excited. He said, I've just had an amazing experience. I know where I'm going now. Um, you know, if this cancer doesn't get me, I, I want to be a preacher like Billy Graham or something. I've just been, um, he said he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, and he just, uh, he said, I'm just beaming, Andrew. I just, he said, I always knew there was more, and I finally found it, and I'm just, you know, so overjoyed. He said, but it's, but it's cost me everything to get it. Yeah. You know, it's almost like his life had to be on its way out before he, before he let it go. And, but um, he received so much more, and he was in a great place. I was there the whole week before he passed away. I was at his bedside, you know. And um, we had some amazing times then too. Uh, yeah, I believe he's in a he's in a good place. And oh, it's it's such an amazing facility, uh, or a place there. It's probably the best kept secret in New Zealand <laughs> at the moment in the in the motorcycle world. Just uh, yes, so much. Uh, all the old classic bikes. It's just like like art really isn't it what the people's creations have come up with over the years and just uh, I'm interested in the engineering side of it and so I do appreciate how a lot of this, this stuff works but the, the, the depth of the collection is uh, quite phenomenal really it's, it's, uh, it's like uh, the Barber Museum in America it's, uh, this is New Zealand's version yeah.